Grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Everything hinges on the death and resurrection of Christ and his ascension to the right hand of the Father. Before these events took place, the disciples didn't get it. They didn't understand why Jesus had to go to Jerusalem. At one time when Jesus predicted his death and resurrection, Peter said, Far be it from me, Lord, that this should take place. In other words, no way, Lord. I don't want you to do that. But after the cross and open tomb, the pieces came together. Especially after Pentecost, the disciples fully understood the purpose of of the death and resurrection of Christ and the gifts and the blessings which these events now give. These events changed everything. One thing it changed is how we pray. Before the death, resurrection, and ascension of our Lord, the disciples never prayed to the Father in the name of Jesus. Jesus said in our text, until now you have asked nothing in my name. But after the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of our Lord, we now pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. And so we ask the Father in the name of Jesus, and he will receive our prayers. God the Father will hear our prayers and will answer them in the best possible way. In other words, the phrase in the name of Jesus simply means that we believe in all that Jesus said and did for us. His life, his death, and his resurrection. This phrase in the name of Jesus is not some magical formula that you can attach to any Muslim or pagan prayer and God will hear and answer it. No, the phrase again means that we believe in Jesus and who he is and what he has done for us and gives to us. God the Father wants you to pray to him. He says, call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you. Pray with confidence that for Jesus' sake, your prayers will be heard and answered. Pray according to God's will. Pray for yourself, for others, those in authority, the church, your neighbor, your enemies. Give thanks to God for all the blessings he has given to you in both body and soul. Especially pray the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father, every day. It's the best prayer ever because it's been given to us from God himself. And so when we pray that his name be holy, his kingdom come and his will be done, for daily bread, forgiveness, strength in the midst of temptation, and deliverance from evil, he will answer these petitions because he has promised he will. The second thing that the cross and resurrection changed is how we can now pray to the Father directly. Jesus said, I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, why will Jesus not ask the Father on our behalf? Because we now can go to the Father directly. After the cross and the resurrection, there is now a reconciliation with our Father, and we can pray to Him directly. In our Old Testament lesson, they were afraid to pray to God directly. They said to Moses, you pray for us and on our behalf. But after the death and resurrection of Christ. There is peace with God our Father through our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, the cross and open tomb changed everything. We can now pray directly to the Father in the name of Jesus, and he will, he will hear our prayers. Our joy will be full. Why? Because God will answer our prayers in the best possible way. Our joy will be full because we know that God loves us. Why will the Father hear our prayers? 
Jesus said, for the Father himself loves you. You know that the Father loves you because he sent his only begotten Son to be your Savior. He is gracious and merciful to you in Christ. And since the Father loves you, then you know that he is eager to hear your prayers. And he desires good things for you. The third thing that the cross and the open tomb changed was how we understand Scripture and God's will. Jesus said to his disciples, I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In other words, before the crucifixion, Jesus spoke to his disciples in obscure language, figures of speech. For example, when he said, I'm the way, the truth, and life, or I am the vine and you are the branches, what does that mean apart from the cross and the resurrection? But after the cross and resurrection, things become clear and plain to us. Before then, the disciples really didn't understand much. They asked him a lot of questions. In our text for today, Jesus said, I came from the Father, and I have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. This is a beautiful summary of Christ's earthly ministry and mission. He came from the Father and has come into our world by way, the way of the Virgin Mary. He died upon the cross for our sins, and he rose for our justification. Forty days later, he ascended back to the Father, where he rules all things. The Ascension of our Lord is a festival that we will celebrate this coming Thursday. Please come. At this point in the text, the disciples then said to Jesus, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. They do believe that Jesus is divine, that he is from the Father, but they do not yet know all things. This text took place in the upper room on the night in which Jesus was betrayed. They thought they understood all things, but their understanding was inadequate. They were mistaken. So Jesus asked them, do you now believe? In other words, do you really know all things? Do you fully believe? They did not fully believe. They did not get it at that point. How do we know this? Because when Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane later on that night, they all ran away. They betrayed him. They fled. And Jesus predicted that this would happen. In our text, he says, Behold, the hour is coming indeed. It has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. And this is exactly what happened. When the guards came to arrest Jesus... The disciples ran away. Jesus was led before the, for the high priest, was put on trial. Then he was handed over to Pilate uh, to be sentenced to, to be crucified. And there on the cross, Christ died for your sins, for the sins of the whole world. His death is an atoning sacrifice. As our epistle lesson said, it was a ransom payment for our sins. The disciples left Jesus, but Jesus was not alone. He said in our text, for the Father is with me. The Father was with him the whole time. Jesus even prayed from the cross, Father, forgive them. And finally he says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Three days, three days later, Jesus rose from the dead. Forty days later, he ascended to the Father, to the right hand, where he rules all things. So after these things, the disciples fully knew why Jesus had to die and rise again. Jesus opened the minds of the disciples so that they could understand the necessity of the cross and the open tomb. Especially after Pentecost, the pieces came together. The apostles knew that Jesus is the Christ 
true God and true man. As true man, he fully fulfilled the law and died in our place. And as true God, he was perfect and overcame our enemies of sin, death, and the devil. The apostles proclaimed the forgiveness of sins to all nations. Many were baptized and churches were established. And thanks be to God for that. Jesus said, the hour is coming when I will tell you plainly about the Father. And that time is now. The four Gospels plainly tell us about the Father. That He is our Creator. That He sustains all things. That He is the one who has sent His only begotten Son to be our Savior. And we learn that the Father and the Son are one along with the Holy Spirit. That there is a trinity one God and three persons of which we were baptized into. The scriptures are very clear and plain in terms of who we are as sinners and the, the redemption that God has given for us poor sinners in his son. And that clear and plain message was preached by the apostles to all nations. Jesus concludes his farewell address that we're in John chapters 14, 15, and 16. He concludes it by saying, I have said these things to you that you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And the fourth and final thing that the cross and the resurrection has changed or provided is peace, a peace that the world can never give. Unfortunately, we live in a fallen world filled with sin. We suffer from our own sin, the stupidity and the mistakes that we make. And also we suffer from the sins of others, family or loved ones. We inherited our sinful nature from our parents and we pass it on to our children. What are the idols in your own life? In what or whom do you trust in above all else? Are you diligent in your prayers? Or have you been lazy, neglecting a regular prayer life? Do you attend worship faithfully? Or do you attend worship sporadically because you prefer to be or do something else? Have you been disrespectful toward those in authority over you? Do you love your neighbor and speak well of your neighbor in the same way that you love yourself? Are you the cause of any disharmony between family or friends? In our Old Testament reading for today, the Israelites confessed their sin. They said, we have sinned. They grumbled against God. They recognized that this was wrong and they confess their sin. May God work repentance in our own lives, confessing our sin, and seeking God's forgiveness in Christ. For where there is no repentance, then the cross and the open tomb means nothing. But where there is repentance, a sorrow over sin, then the gifts of the cross and the resurrection are so comforting and appreciated so much. We not only suffer from our own sin and from the sin of others, we also suffer from a world ruined by sin that groans as well. Recently there have been uh, fires in West Texas flooding in the Midwest and tornadoes in many states. God have mercy upon those who have lost a loved one or who need relief because of these natural disasters. We also suffer from affliction, sickness, hardship, trial, tribulation. Things are not perfect. And they never will be perfect. And don't expect them to be. We will suffer even from the wrong and the injustice of others. Jesus said, in the world, you will have tribulation. He is simply being honest. He doesn't promise us a rose garden here on earth. He understands our situation. And 
the fall into sin that we suffer from. Yet, in the midst of our trouble, we are reminded that Jesus has overcome the world. He has paid for our sin. He has crushed the head of the devil. And he has opened heaven for us. In Christ, you have a peace that the world can never give. You have a peace knowing that you are reconciled with the Father on account of the Son. You have a peace knowing that God has removed your sin as far as the east is from the west. You have a peace knowing that God hears your prayers and does care about you. You have a peace knowing that you are a baptized lamb and no one can take you can take that away from you. You have a peace knowing that Christ's body and blood comes to you this morning from this altar. Dearly beloved, God is your refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. He helps you to endure the troubles that come into your life. He hears your prayer, and his gospel and sacrament are your source of comfort and strength in the midst of suffering and tribulation. Earlier I said that everything hinges on the death and resurrection of Christ and, and his ascension to the right hand of the Father. This is true. Because Christ died and rose again, you have peace with God our Father through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus and a life everlasting. Amen. Amen.